Uh, good, good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, I'm Ralph Holm, RNID's Executive Director of Research, and I'd like to welcome everyone to um, the Hearing Medicines Discovery Syndicate's final webinar of the series, exploring the challenges and opportunities of developing hearing therapeutics. Um, before we get started, a few um, housekeeping notices. We've got live um, speech to text reporting, and if you want to access that, you can um, click on the, the caption, um, closed caption button at the, at the bottom of your um, screen. Um, we've also got two BSL interpreters. Um, if, if anyone's having any problems accessing communication support, um, please just let us know in, in the chat box. I've got a couple of um, talks coming up, um, and then we have a, a panel session um, at the end with all of our speakers. So, so if you do have any um, questions, and hope, hopefully you, you will have questions, um, if you could add the questions in the, in the Q&A box that you can see on the, on the bottom of your screen. Um, and, if, and if you're wanting to direct your um, question to a particular speaker, um, add, add their name. Um, and you can also like other people's questions if there's a question there that you like, um, and, and we can make sure we, we ask, ask those. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question at the end in, in BSL, if you, if you raise your virtual um, hand, then, then we can turn on the camera and you, you can ask a question in, in BSL. So that's, so that's the, um, the housekeeping um, bits out, out of the way. So, so this afternoon, um, we're focused on cell and gene therapy approaches to treating um, hearing loss. And I'm, I'm delighted that we've been able to team up with the cell and gene therapy catapult and London Advanced Therapies, who are co-chairing um, the webinar um, this afternoon. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Lee Dunham from the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, who's, who's going to um, lead us off. Thanks very much, Ralph. And uh, thank you for having me along today. Um, I'm part of the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, a sister organization to the Medicines Discovery Catapult, who've kindly organized a fantastic series so far um, by way of a brief introduction, the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult and, and the Medicines Discovery guys as well are UK government funded non-profit um, research and technology organisations. And the clue is very much in our name. At the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, we have specialist expertise in the industrialization and commercialization of advanced therapies um, with teams focused on process and analytical development, regulatory affairs, non-clinical and clinical delivery to provide support to researchers, company and pharma um, in accelerating the development of their novel cell and gene therapies and getting them to patients. Um, I'd like to look forward to the talks and the discussions that we have coming up. And I'll, um, I'd like to hand over to Francesca Glubik from the London Advanced Therapies to introduce herself. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm the director of London Advanced Therapies. Um, uh, London Advanced Therapies is a, a program uh, funded by Research England. Um, a, a group of academics in 2018 came together thinking that in London, uh, thinking that uh, it would be great to organize a series of activities that encourage London to work together, but also um, that help uh, external partners that want to work with uh, uh, London um, experts uh, in the field of cell and gene therapies. And uh, two years later, we received funds from Richard Research England and uh, we um, initiated many activities. We funded in excess of uh, 32 projects uh, connecting both uh, London University among each other and also small companies uh, to work with London University. Um, we drafted contracts uh, um, and we supported negotiation of contracts, so the collaborative contracts, so that would uh, be easier and faster the resolution of uh, contractual issues to enable collaborative work. We also map uh, expertise, so we have uh, a, a list of more in excess of 230 researchers that work within London. And all these activities are really aimed at bringing together uh, the academic community and also to help uh, anyone from companies, uh, research institutions, universities from the rest of UK and worldwide that want to work with London experts. 
And uh, looking forward, we're now looking to extend and collaborate with other regions to create uh, a UK-wide uh, collaborative networks. Uh, we call it network of networks. And um, this is the reason why I was absolutely delighted when the colleagues from Catapult introduced me to Claudia Concalves and Jessica, and uh, um, I was invited to join in this very interesting seminar. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you Professor Karen Harahan, uh, Vice Dean of, and Head of Genomics of Desna Laboratory at the Faculty of Medicine in uh, Tel Aviv. Unmute, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm so excited to be here. This is really an outstanding opportunity to have a chance to meet my colleagues, for you to hear the latest that's happening in the field. And this is an extraordinarily exciting time for the field. Uh, we'll show some examples in the next couple of hours and we'll have a panel discussion. And I hope that we'll be able to show you that this is really uh, a very, um, I'd say in terms of time, uh, quite a significant one because much of the discoveries that have been made in our field in the last decades are really coming to fruition now. And we're starting to see that we can take, we as in the royal we, many people involved of course worldwide, to be able to take all of the research that's been done and move it into a translational arena. So let me share my slides with you and tell you, um, give you a bit of an overview, uh, as well as share some of the latest data that we've been able to uh, um, come up with in our laboratory. So first again, I wanna thank you for this really wonderful opportunity. And I've been very fortunate in our laboratory to also be funded by, by the RNID. And in fact, that was the the seed money that we were able to use to start the project that I'm going to tell you about today. And as a result, uh, we have a paper that's coming out probably in the next week or two in embromolecular medicine. So I'd say that your help has really truly been invaluable. I'm arriving to you from, well, physically, I'm actually in Tel Aviv now. I'm from Tel Aviv University. Uh, and as you heard, I'm vice dean of the Faculty of Medicine. But really what I spend most of my time on is running the Genomics of Deference Laboratory. We've been working for many years to try to discover genes that are involved and associated with hearing loss. So what we've been trying to do for many years in our laboratory is try to first identify the genes that lead to hearing loss and to figure out how they're involved in the normal function of the inner ear. We also are interested as a next step to understand how gene expression is regulated and how do these pathways, how are they involved in inner ear function? And finally, we wanna understand how do alterations in both the genetic and epigenetic level contribute to deafness. And we've been taking a, a, a triad of approaches in order to answer these questions. The first is by human deafness gene discovery. The second is by gene expression and regulation. And the third, and mostly what I'll tell you about today, is our project on gene therapy. And I would invite you to take a look at our website. The link is written here in the bottom, or you can just Google my name and you should come up with a website where we try to keep our website as updated as possible to tell you about the discoveries that we've made in our lab. The genetics of hearing loss has been really a remarkable journey in the last uh, two decades or so. And it really started in a few decades ago when the discovery of Conexin 26 was made. And many of you know, this is the most common form of congenital deafness appearing in children. And this really started a, a huge boost for being to uncover the genes that are involved in hereditary hearing loss. And today we know of over 100 genes that are involved. The genes that you're seeing here listed throughout the human chromosomes um, are pretty much randomly distributed throughout the genome. The different colors signify whether they're involved in either non-syndromic or syndromic hearing loss, whether they're inherited in a dominant or in a recessive form. 
we've been very fortunate here in Israel because we've been able to study both Israeli Jewish as well as Palestinian Arab families. And um, in order to do so, in the early days, we did, um, we did uh, linkage analysis and we needed very large families. And in the past couple of years, we've been able to take advantage of high throughput sequencing and next generation sequencing in order to be able to identify the genes, even in very small families, or when we were only able to obtain a few members of any family. I'd like to emphasize that our work that was done here was done uh, primarily by Dr. Sipora Brownstein in my laboratory. She's in charge of the human genetics, as well as with Professor Moeen Kanan from Palestine. And he's been a major colleague of ours in understanding the genetics of hearing loss in the Palestinian Arab population. It's also been very important for us to share the, um, um, the knowledge that we've gained with the public, as well as health professionals who are working with the deaf community, parents of deaf children. And so we've put out brochures that explain the genetics of hearing loss in a very simple way, both in Hebrew and in Arabic. Now, I told you that we've been trying to understand the genetics of deafness taking three different approaches. And the third approach that we started a few years ago was to try to, once we've discovered all these genes, how can we actually ultimately provide what we would all like to, and that's to be able to find a treatment or a cure for the patients that we work with. And so very briefly, I'll just give you a, um, uh, an overview of gene therapy and tell you that this is the insertion of the modification of nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA for therapeutics. We've all been hearing a lot about RNA recently with the COVID vaccines, but most of what we're doing is working with DNA. And there are many different ways that we can do so. We can use either gene replacement, we can do gene, use gene sil uh, silencing. If we have a splice mutation, we can work on splicing alterations. And what we decided to do in our approach is to use viral delivery of a wild type gene and essentially to replace the defective gene with, um, uh, with a, um, a healthy gene. And so the uh, method of choice in, in the inner ear is to use viral vectors, typically AV vectors. And these AV vectors um, are relatively non-immunogenic and they can integrate into the host genome. Uh, the only disadvantage is they can only carry up to about 4.7 kb, but if you're working with a gene that's relatively small, as is the story I'll tell you about in a few moments, then AV is really an ideal uh, vehicle to use. So what's actually been done in the years leading up to the work that I'm going to tell you about in a few moments? Well, there's been some really major breakthroughs that have been done in this area. And really the first uh, paper that came out that talked about gene therapy um, in using this method was where they um, performed hearing rescue in a genetic model of VGLUT3. They used the conventional AAV2 to deliver the VGLUT3 gene and they were able to using this viral vector to rescue the hearing loss in this mutant. And then later on, um, Jennifer Lenz uh, in Michelle Hastings group was able to rescue not only hearing but also vestibular function using antisense oligonucleotides. And this was in a mouse model of human deafness as well as uh, um, a model for Usher syndrome. The first synthetic AV vector was used um, uh, finally to transduce outer hair cells efficiently. And this was used uh, using a, um, uh, a synthetic AV called ANC80165. And since then, there's been several other synthetic capsids that have been developed. The AV9PHBP, quite a mouthful, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, and another AV27M8. So a lot of jargon there, but it becomes very important when you're looking for the most effective AV. Um, further work that's been done in the past is the first use of a CRISPR-Cas9 in the ear to, uh, to knock out um, in uh, working with the dominant allele. And so this was, of course, uh, quite a breakthrough that was made a couple of years ago. And very recently, uh, the first use of base editing was used in the ear. And this was the first time a deafness-causing variant uh, was corrected to the wild-type sequence. 
And this was done using a, a dual AV approach because of the size of the insert of the gene that had to be put in there. So there's been really some uh, outstanding work that's been done uh, in the field so far. And in fact, uh, RNID and the catapult medicines discovery pipeline has actually looked at a number of uh, discoveries that were made. Most of the work that's been done tonight to now has been on the small molecule level. Um, on the gene therapy approaches, and you can see some of the work that's been done here uh, and provided as unpublished data so far, but most of the advanced gene therapy was based on a program from Novartis um, delivering the CGF-166. Uh, this trial has currently been paused, but I think that we can learn a lot from, from this trial. It was the first gene therapy trial ever performed and so exciting as was quoted by uh, Larry Lustig, um, was very exciting on many levels. Today, there's only one company globally, Rinry Therapeutics, which is working on a pipeline of cell therapy agents. So let me tell you about the work that we've actually been doing in our lab. And I, I think that this has really complemented the work that's been done uh, up to now. This is, and I'm gonna tell you about the first gene therapy approach that was taken in Israel. So very exciting for us. And also the first time it was used for this particular gene called SYN4, which encodes the Nesprin4 protein. So way back in 2013, our laboratory discovered a mutation in this gene called SYN4 in two Israeli families. And you can see the pedigrees outlined here. Now this is a critical gene because the protein that it encodes is involved in anchoring, um, uh, anchoring the cytoskeleton of, uh, to the nucleus. And that's essential for many different reason, uh, reasons, um, but in the inner ear, um, and the, it becomes very important for both the inner and outer hair cells. And it has to do with, you'll see subsequently, most probably for the function of electromotility in the outer hair cells. And so a mutation in this gene leads effectively to a knockout in, in humans, and so there's no functional protein being made. We joined forces with Brian Burr, Colin Stewart, and Henning Horn. They had constructed a knockout and had worked on it for about two years and hadn't been able to find any sort of phenotype in those mice. So we contacted them because they had published a paper on Nesrin 4. They hadn't yet talked about the knockout, but knowing them, I figured they probably have one in the works. They were very relieved when we contacted them because they hadn't even thought about checking whether these mice were deaf. And if you look at the audiograms that you can see here, the mice at by postnatal day 60, you can see this top red line here are completely deaf at two months of age. So this was a really excellent model for us to be able to look uh, at what was happening in, uh, in, the, in the inner ears of these mice. And it was C.P. Brownstein, who I told you about earlier, who identified this human mutation. We looked subsequently at the hair cells of those mice, but we really needed to look a little further. And that's where Shachal Tiber's work comes in. Shachal, who you'll meet a little bit later, is uh, an MD-PhD student in the lab, and he decided to explore even further when the outer hair cells were dying in these SYN4 mutant mice. And what he found that the cells died between postnatal day eight and postnatal day 14, so a relatively small window. And this was very significant because if we wanted to think of when a viable window for intervention for gene therapy would be, we really needed to know when these mice were dying. He also was able to look at, um, at, at postnatal day eight at FM143 uptake and was able to see that these mice were still transducing, but very quickly, these mice lose their ability to be functional. And why was this important? Because we chose postnatal day zero to be able to introduce the gene therapy. And the idea was, could we prevent this degeneration and the malfunction of the outer hair cells occurring? So we entered into a collaboration with Jeff Holt, who's at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And this has turned out to really be a just very fruitful collaboration with really remarkable results. And I'm excited to, this is one of the first opportunities that we have to actually talk about our results. 
So the approach that we decided to take was a gene replacement therapy where we would deliver the coding sequence of SYN4 via AAV. We use this knockout that I had told you about. It's a recessive mutation. And really the advantage that we have of the ear and being able to use this type of therapy is that it's non-dividing tissue, it's anatomically isolated, and the approach that we took was to inject into the posterior semicircular canal. We also tried the approach of injecting into the round window. We had better success with the um, uh, semicircular canal, so we decided to take this approach. You can see here on the bottom, the timeline that we took, the injection was done at post, about postnatal day one, all the way to being able to do the many tests, which I'll tell you about, to see where we were able to actually rescue the hearing in these mice. We decided to go with the AV9 PHB dot, uh, period P, um, uh, uh, AAV, and that was because it had been previously shown in a number of papers that I list here that it can effectively transduce cochlear hair cells at a very high rate. And so Shachal took, uh, injected with this AAV with GFP in order to be able to see what his, uh, um, the percent transduction was, and we were very lucky because the transduction rate was really at 100%. And so Shachal did uh, immunos to be able to check the transduction rate. We also counted the hair cells and we were able to see that we were getting very high transduction rate in both the inner and outer hair cells. And we did see that we had a higher transduction rate um, or at least the outer hair cells were much brighter. This could be because there are more copies of the virus going uh, into the outer hair cell and possibly um, such a bright signal because we we're using GFP. We imaged the ears using uh, an Aries scan microscope, which is very sensitive. Uh, and we continued to work with this AV9 because it turned out to really be an ideal AV to be able to insert the SYN4 gene. When we did this in uh, the injections, and uh, I think very uh, clearly you can see here that this AV SYN4 was able to rescue the outer hair cell morphology in the SYN4 knockout mice. So first you can see at postnatal day 14 wild type, you can see the outer hair cells. And what I didn't mention before, which is quite significant, is that in the mutants, we, we find that the nucleus actually begins to almost in a way float up to the top of the hair cell. Now that's presumably because we've lost the nesprin 4, which is anchoring the cytoskeleton to the nucleus. And so the nucleus essentially has lost its optimal position. And in the outer hair cell, that turns out, in order for electromotility to, to occur, to be very important at the base of the hair cell. And now if we look at these rescued uh, outer hair cells in which the AV SYN4 has been delivered, you can see that now the nucleus is very nicely placed um, and still at the base of the hair cell. And you can see this very beautiful structure um, of the knockout at postnatal day 14, where you would expect a vast degeneration of the cells, but you can see again, just a beautiful structure to both the inner and outer hair cells with the AV and the SYN4. On the bottom panel, you can see the localization of the nucleus uh, in the middle in the postnatal day 14, at the top in the knockout, and now in the rescue mutant, again, it's down toward the base of the outer hair cell as we would expect, very similar to what's happening in the wild type. But what we really wanna know is what about the hearing? Well, fortunately, the hearing thresholds measured by ABR were very compatible with what we saw with the rescued morphology. Um, and in fact, if you look at the ABR thresholds and you compare the wild type mouse, which is shown in green, to um, the SYN4 mutants, which is shown in red, and now if you follow it four weeks, the blue line represents the rescued mouse mutant. And you can see that the hearing uh, levels are almost identical to the wild type mice. But the question that we had, of course, is what happens as we go further in time? Well, if we look at 12 weeks, you can also see that um, the rescue is still maintained at that time. And we also looked at what's happening on autoacoustic emissions because of the damage 
that's occurring primarily to the outer hair cells. And what we also found is when we looked at this treatment, that the treatment over a, a longer period of time does prevent hair cell loss. We examined um, these mice uh, up to 12 weeks. We can see that we still maintain uh, the hair cells. So, so the prevention of hair cell loss continues from four weeks and continues out to 12 weeks. We've now looked at as far as 24 weeks and there doesn't seem to be a significant difference between the 12 and the 24 weeks. So very clearly it appears that delivering or performing the gene replacement with SIN4 is not only uh, rescuing the hearing uh, and creating mice that would have been deaf but are now able to hear, but it's also uh, saving the morphology uh, 24 weeks out uh, after the treatment. Um, so now one of the question is, is one treatment uh, sufficient? Do we need to continue with more treatments? Um, and we're continuing that work to find out which direction we need to go in. But again, we're quite comforted by the fact that as far as 24 weeks, we still have that rescue. So where are we taking that work now as we move forward um, with the rest of the work in our laboratory incorporating both the human genetics as well as what's happening with respect to the work on gene therapy. So we've joined forces with an HMO in Israel, which has a biobank. And we have in Israel a population of approximately 8 million people. And this HMO has two and a half million patients. I happen to be one of them. And we've gone through their databases and there are about 165,000 individuals out of that 2.5 million who have some form of disabling hearing loss, which is about 6.6%. .6 We've gone through the, uh, the biobank has about 130,000 patients uh, collected and about 8,000 of those have a hearing loss. So again, that number is consistent about 6%. We're now working in precision medicine where we're taking uh, a subset of those and we're gonna be performing whole genome sequencing in an attempt first to look at the genetic basis of deafness throughout Israel, as well as to try to identify new genes that are identified in the population. In a previous work that we published this past July, we've been able to show that there are 32 genes that are associated with hearing loss in the Israeli Jewish population, and we'd like to see if there are more. We're also continuing with um, joining, uh, with combining newborn screening for hearing testing that's done in the hospitals. It's a uh, national law, so all infants that are born are checked by autoacoustic emissions before they leave the hospital. And those that'll fail the test, will uh, uh, we're gonna be doing performing whole gene, whole exome sequencing. And this is a pilot that we're now conducting with the Ministry of Health. Finally, I wanna just mention, though I know not in the direct line of what we're talking about today, but I do think given that we're in the middle of a pandemic that I should mention the work that we're doing with COVID-19 and hearing. This is work that's being done primarily by Dr. Amiel Dror. He's a resident, ENT resident up uh, in the north of Israel, and he did his MD PhD in our laboratory. And we've put, um, uh, we have a paper coming out that actually shows that there's no significant difference between uh, a number of recovered patients and control. Uh, this is contrary to some earlier studies that were less thorough that suggested that there might be some type of hearing loss post um, COVID-19. And we're expanding that study to look at more patients. But something I think that is critically important to share with all of you is one of the major issues over this during this pandemic is the lack of accessible material, both on websites and videos to um, those that are hearing impaired as well as people with disabilities. And so we've put, uh, we have two papers, one of them that's now accessible on BioArchive, reporting the lack of the accessibility, hoping very much that the ministries of health worldwide will take notice of this work and work on um, actually increasing and improving the accessibility because there's no time um, that's more critical than during a difficult time as the one that we're going through now. Um, so that's what I'm gonna, talk to you about today, I want to uh, acknowledge again the RNID for that really critical 
uh, funding at a time which, which was very important to us. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the other funding that we have from different sources worldwide. I want to acknowledge our collaborators and all of the people that are working in my laboratory during this work. And I want to thank you very much for being the audience today. That's great. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I think we're going to be taking questions at the end. So I'd like to remind everybody, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom and we'll, we'll bring them up at the end during the panel discussion. Thank you, Karen. Um, so now we're going to slightly change tack away from gene therapy and focus on to cell therapy approaches. And I'd like to introduce Professor Marcelo Revolta, founder of Rinri Therapeutics and Professor of Sensory Stem Cell Biology at the University of Sheffield. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Lee, for the introduction. Uh, so you just let me share my screen. Can you all see my presentation? Yeah, perfect. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, yes, just before I start, I, I'd really like to thank and, and to congratulate this uh, group of the Healing Medicine Discovery Syndicate because they are putting together this fantastic uh, webinar series and I really feel very grateful and honored to have been invited to be part of this, of this group and my thanks, yes, to, to, to Jess, to, to Claudia and to Ralph for this fantastic series. And, and following kind of the, the request of the organizers, um, I'm going to present this uh, talk into two parts. The initial bit is a bit of an overview and top level kind of a, a review of uh, our approach, the technology that we have developed. And then I talk a little bit about Rinri -re Therapeutics and how it came to be. So let me start just by making the case why we think that uh, there is a very good case for uh, cell therapy, particularly stem cell therapy approach for healing loss. And uh, I think the, the, key, the first thing to say is that there are many conditions that produce healing loss, but the final outcome is cellular damage and cellular loss. So regardless of the etiology that, that you, you have loss of, of, of cell populations. And, and cells, uh, the way I see it, is a, it's a bit like the, uh, the building blocks of, of, of an organ. So if you want to build a house, you need the bricks. If you want to build an organ, if you want to repair an organ, you need the cells. So conceptually, uh, a cell therapy has the potential to replace uh, multiple uh, affected cell type as long as we can produce the appropriate cell types in, in, in the lab. And for the appropriate cell, uh, 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 it's not only the specific lineage, but sometimes it could be uh, uh, the progenitor that will produce that lineage. And conceptually, any damaged cell lineage that can be produced could be potentially be replaced. Uh, obviously, uh, the, 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 the more attractive ones, the, the top of the priority list are the sensory cells i.e. The, the hair cells and the spiral ganglion neurons, but there are other cell types that could be targeted by the approach, for example, cells of the, uh, uh, of the sort of striovascularis, uh, another cell population that could be also very important uh, in the organ. If we're concentrating in, on the spiral ganglion and the hair cell, the, the thing to highlight is that these two cell types <clears throat> share the same developmental origin. They're not sibling, they're not sister cells, they're not produced at the same time, but they're produced, they're coming from the same structure, from the same organ that is the otic placode and the autosis during development. So if you can produce sort of a, a coherent protocol and a coherent method that will produce one lineage, you will probably produce the other one as well. And as you know, uh, uh, probably for this audience, it's completely unnecessary to highlight uh, we mammals have lost the ability to, to regenerate these cells, the, the hair cells and the spiral ganglion neurons. Uh, we are born with the complement of cells, which is meant to last the lifetime because cell divisions are only taking place in utero. The, there is a huge uh, population uh, affected by, by hearing loss. 
uh, different figures, but it's sort of half a billion uh, people affected worldwide, depending on how you measure that. And obviously, it's a very uh, clear unmet medical need. There is no biological uh, restorative treatment in place for healing loss. We know that there are, there are the, the, the healing aids and cochlear implants, which are very good prosthetic devices, but there are no really uh, biological treatment in place for this condition. And uh, a, a very uh, good thing compared to other aspects of regenerative medicine, we have a very small target, a very small uh, number of target cells. If you think about a normal human cochlea, you have about 16,000 hair cells and about 30 to 40,000 neurons. So from, from the kind of uh, uh, manufacturing point of view, trying to make enough cells for, 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 for one of these organs is not really very demanding. Uh, other areas of regenerative medicine uh, uh, have uh, a substantial bigger challenge. For example, if you're trying to make enough cells to repair a heart of a liver or an organ of that size. So we talk about stem cells. Uh, you probably have heard a lot about stem cells, but they are different type of stem cells. And so not all of stem cells are, are, are comparable and, and equal. One population which had been uh, uh, for around for a long time are what we call mesenchymal stem cells or cells which are, are extracted from different tissues, for example, from fat tissue. Uh, we have done some work with them, with mesenchymal stem cells, with dental pulp cells, but the ones which are concentrated and I find them more, more attractive and potentially more interesting uh, are the pluripotent stem cells, particularly from a point of view, if you're thinking like our, our approach is based on, on cell replacement. Uh, pluripotent stem cells basically means uh, that there are cells which have are a completely white canvas and they have the potential to produce any cell type of the human body. Pluripotency means that they have the potential to produce any derivative of, from the three germ layers, ectodermal cells, mesodermal cells, and endodermal cells. And the key thing is finding the way of pushing them in the right uh, track, putting them in the right track to, to get the right lineage that, that, that you want. Uh, there are uh, the, the human embryonic stem cells. There are two types of these pluripotent stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, which are originated from uh, early stage uh, blastocysts, from the inner cell man of the blastocyst. Uh, and they are considered to be kind of the, the, the natural uh, population of, of pluripotent stem cells. And then there are the human induced pluripotent stem cells, which are uh, 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 derived uh, through a, a, a technology that it was developed by uh, Professor Shingan Yamanaka in 2006 in Japan. And, and it's the ability to reprogram cells. You can reset the program of any somatic cell, usually are cells like fibroblasts from skin, and reset them and transform them in cells which have uh, the same properties of a human embryonic stem cell. The, 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 the path of using induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs as they are called, is that uh, they have the, the, has the potential of developing a personalized medicine, patient-specific medicine. However, uh, the cost at the moment of that approach is, is really huge and, and it's not, and that also there are uh, more complex regulatory issues with IPSC. So uh, most of the, we have worked with both, we are working with both, but most of our initial work and the thing that we're developing at the moment are using uh, human, human embryonic stem cells. So what we did a number of years ago was develop uh, a method to drive the differentiation of human embryonic stem cells, mimicking what happens normally in development. And, and by exposing these cells to these sort of developmental cues, we generated a population of OT progenitors. We have produced two types of progenitors, one which is epithelial in nature, we call them OEPs. Uh, and then these cells can be taken further by a second part of the method of the process uh, to differentiate into hair cells like cells, and they have expressed some of the markers and the electrophysiological properties of a hair cell. But on the other hand, we have this other population, which is the OMPs, the otic neural progenitor, and then they can be taken further to differentiate into auditory neurons, which again express the markers of the auditory neurons, the spiral ganglion neurons, but also electrophysiological properties of them. And at that point, we decided to concentrate on, on working with the OMPs and taking the OMP further uh, as a, uh, as a, a thera uh, therapy or as a, a, a putative therapy for the treatment of auditory neuropathies, trying to target and replacing the damaged paraganglion neurons. Uh, the reason for this is on one level is because we think that uh, for this kind of 
technique for this kind of strategy. The, the spinal ganglion neurons are initially the more amenable target, but also because there is a clear medical uh, uh, need. Although the group of patients with uh, auditory neuropathy are perhaps smaller than the, 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 the patients which are affected by, by hair cell loss, it's a group of patients that uh, we can do very little uh, uh, for them. Uh, the, if, you, if you lost your hair cells, in many cases, you will be uh, uh, eligible for a cochlear implant. However, if, you, if the neurons are gone, uh, your cochlear implant will be very, uh, perform very badly or will not work at all. And, and that's out of this, this group of patients has basically uh, no or, or, or very, very limited therapeutic options. And that's why we're concentrating on them initially. So uh, to work with auditory neuropathy, we then uh, use uh, a, 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 a disease model, which is sort of a, or a model of the condition, which is in the gerbil. And, and the neuropathy model in the gerbil was developed by the group Schmidt and, and also by Lang in, in the University of South Carolina. And if you apply WAVA indirectly into the run window of the ear, you kill the, the type 1 spiral neuron. It's a model that we have adapted and refined in our lab. And, and in this context, in these animals, uh, we transplanted cells using a, a surgical approach, which is very similar to the one that is used commonly in ontology uh, uh, to get to the wrong window. And so we, we, we go through the wrong window through a, 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 a retroricular blostomy and, and injected in the, in the cochlear in the modulus of, of, of these animals, uh, the, the OMPs that we have generated in vitro. And what we saw was integration and engraftment of these cells, differentiation of the cells, but more interesting sort of functional recovery as measured by the recovery of, of ABR thresholds uh, throughout time. Uh, that was uh, done a while ago now, and since then we have moved quite a bit, developing this technology further. Uh, we have sort of then uh, repeated those experiments using a different line and a slightly different approach uh, using uh, a line that has uh, a fluorescent reporter, which is driven by otic specific sequence. And this allows us to uh, enrich, but also purify the, the OMP population by cell sorting. One, uh, one thing that our protocol has is that after purification, there is an expansion phase when we can uh, increase the numbers of OMPs. So again, uh, that's very useful from a point of view of translating this into, into, into the clinic because we can can produce really substantial number of these cells. And then we transplanted these cells in the, in the animal model. Uh, we got very good purity uh, of almost 99% of, of purity of the, of the right population of cells using this fluorescent reporter. And then we transplanted them and we did a long-term follow-up showing uh, a persistence of the recovery long-term, but also uh, we started these animals looking from biosafety of, of the approach. We did sort of uh, uh, terminal uh, body scans and head scans using uh, high resolution MRIs. Uh, and we couldn't, we found no evidence of, of tumor formation. And also we did analysis of biodistribution and showing that the cells sort of keep, are, are retained within the cochlea. They don't uh, go into different organs around the body. So uh, what else sort of we, sort of we then have taken a more emphasis in, in, in developing the, the, the process of making these cells and we have now a protocol, which is uh, as a, it's a, it's an enhanced version of the original protocol, uh, starting the, the GMP adaptation of this protocol by removing all the uh, products of animal origin, the so, so CINO3. And we have also replaced the, the use of this fluorescent reporter by using uh, cell surface markers that allow us to prospectively purify uh, with comparable uh, results, this population. And again, this will be uh, uh, something that we can do it in a, in a, in a manufacturing setting uh, and, and not having to do uh, to use a, a cell which has been genetically modified. So with this aim and this vision, uh, we, 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 with the aim of, of, of taking this to the, to the clinic and, and, and going sort of trying to make uh, this uh, technology having an impact in, for, for, for in the real world, so to be able to, 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 to treat patients uh, uh, we, we decided to take uh, them into a real therapeutic alternative. And about two years ago, then we founded uh, Rindry Therapeutics. So for an academic like myself, this has been a, a new uh, challenging, but also a, a very exciting journey. 
there are a few things which I think are important to share about this experience and they may be useful uh, for some of you which are in academia and are thinking about starting on, on a similar path. Uh, the, the first thing I would like to say, which I think is very important, is that uh, it, it's, it's critical to have a good uh, knowledge transfer or com commercialization managers in the institution that you work. Uh, they are fundamental in the early stages in the process and also in the later stages in the process because they will help you navigate that interface between the academic side and the new potential funders. I, I was uh, very lucky to have the support of a very competent team at the University of Sheffield, mainly in the figure of uh, uh, Andy Hogman, uh, and, and later sort of Rob McMaster sort of join in. And um, because the university has invested into uh, Rinry Ross now is, is uh, part of the, of, it's a, it's a direct, uh, director uh, representing the university uh, at the in the company. A second thing that I think is important to highlight is that it's critical to attract investors that are very uh, that are suitable for the particular stage of the company and that understand the technology. Again, I, I was very lucky to have the support of two corporate investors, Erika Whitaker from UCV Ventures and uh, Frank Kalkbrenner from Beringer Ingelheim uh, Venture Fund and one institutional regional investor, Claire Brown from BioCity. And the three of them, Erica, Frank, and Claire, have been fantastic and absolutely a pleasure to work with because they completely understand the science behind this development. They share our enthusiasm, but also they fully realize that biology has its times. And we all want to get to clinical trials, but we want to get there in the safest and more efficient possible way. And, and they have been very supportive, a pleasure to work with them. This is how Rinry was born. And for those of you which are uh, wonder, because people have asked me this before, uh, the origin of the name comes from the Quechua and means ear or hearing. Quechua is the, the language spoken by the original peoples from Northern and Central Argentina, which is where I'm originally from. So Rinri is a, is a lean company that has a semi-virtual structure. Uh, but it's consolidating, which I think is a great team, uh, bringing together people with significant and very complementary expertise. Soon after incorporation, uh, we attracted Simon Chandler as our CEO. Uh, Simon had experience as an investment director and that had developed business working uh, as part of the uh, IP group. Uh, Rindri has benefited greatly from his drive and incredible energy uh, to move things forward. And again, it's been fantastic to work with him uh, uh, up to date. We then uh, uh, added uh, Natalie Mount as an independent uh, non-executive director. And, and she's coming with a lot of experience developing ATMPs with Pfizer and Incentives and also with self uh, uh, therapy catapult. And very recently, we have appointed Terry Gaskell as our uh, CTO and Nick Higgins as our independent chair, both again with great expertise in developing commercial cell products on an industrial setting that complement well our academics experience in stem cell and regenerative medicine. We also have a series of uh, partners and collaborators that provide strengths and insight into different areas of our process development. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the support of institutions and funders that have backed the work of my lab at different stages in time. Relevant to this forum, I will particularly like to thank the RNID, just as Karen was saying in her presentation before, the support of the RNID has always been unwavering and fundamental, particularly in the very challenging initial stages of the projects. I also uh, acknowledge my collaborators and, and current and past members of the lab, but in particular, Leila, Nob, Daniela, and Bronte, which are currently supported by RINRI and are continue to deliver the outstanding work that is underpinning RINRI's progress. Thank you very much. I will leave it there. I'm happy to discuss and take questions uh, in our panel in a minute. Thank you so much for this very interesting speaker, Marcelino. 
And um, now we'll have a panel session. And so Marcelo, you please uh, stay on um, with the, the video camera on and uh, uh, Professor Havraham will join us back. And uh, the other panelists are Professor Robinali, Deputy Director of Guys in St. Thomas's BRC and lead of the BRC New Advanced Therapies Accelerator. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Munye, the lead scientist and cell and gene therapist catapult, and uh, Shaha Tiber, an MND PhD student in the Genomic of Deafness Laboratory, the Faculty of Medicine in Tel Aviv. Um, I will ask uh, the new panelists that are joining now to introduce the suit, just, just say a few words about themselves, calling their name um, one by one. Robin, please, you go first. Hello, uh, thank you, Francesca. So I'm Robin Ali. Um, I'm a professor of human molecular genetics at uh, King's College London, and my interests are uh, development of gene and cell therapies for retinal disorders. Dr. Munye, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correct, and apologies if I'm not. Oh, you've got it perfectly right there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Mustafa Munya. I'm one of the lead scientists at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, um, so within the industrialization team here. Um, my focus is on also cell and gene therapies, and, and that's what, what it has been uh, for, for my entire professional career, actually. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, Shahar Tiber. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Shahar. I'm, uh, I'm an MDPT student in uh, the lab of Professor Karen Abraham, who you just heard from. Um, and I work primarily on uh, gene therapy uh, in deafness. Thank you. For the next 30 minutes, uh, Lee will uh, lead uh, a conversation, a discussion on the opportunities and challenges that uh, cell and gene therapies can offer for uh, hearing loss. Great, thanks very much, Francesca, and thank you to Marcelo and Karen for the talks. Um, really insightful, and I think some fantastic work going on. Um, we've had some questions posed to us before the event and some questions uh, that have come in. Please do keep adding questions onto the Q&A, and I think you can raise your hand as well so we can get the cameras turned on. Um, so I've got a question that was posed during um, your talk, Karen, and I think it's relevant for, for both you and Marcelo. Um, the question was, can you reverse deafness as well as prevent it? I think we'll start with, with your gene therapy approach and then I move over to Marcelo. So in the case of, of the AV, um, it, it's really about prevention. And so if we're going to be talking about um, um, a change afterwards, then we'd have to be involved in more of the regeneration and cell therapy approach that Marcelo can talk about. Uh, but what we did with the AV was prevent the onset of the damage. And that's why the time where the most damage occurs and the point of intervention was so critical. Um, and before I'll let Marcelo answer, Marcelo, congratulations, just beautiful work. And I really, I wondered about the name. So thank you for telling us that. But really, it's, it's spectacular to see the transition to translational work um, so at this point. And so to you, Marcelo, so the reverse reversal of deafness rather than prevention. Yeah. Um, and how does your approach really differ to, to Karen's? First of all, th thank you, Karen, for, for the comment. Well, yeah, the name is something that is, I've been asking quite a bit because it's, uh, it's not obvious, but yeah, I'm very proud of the name. And, and thank you for the comment. Excellent work yours as well. So uh, it's, it's, well, the it's credit there goes to all, all together like that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think. Uh, the protective or the kind of uh, auto, yeah the protective strategy is is quite established in, in with different modalities in the field particularly the use of small molecules but there are very very few which are really trying to uh, approach or trying to develop sort of a restorative treatment and that's what we're trying to do and, and the proof of concept that we have is for sort of uh, restoring uh, a hearing loss, and, and, and you can imagine so if the population is gone and you transplant it and, and, and the new population sort of engrafted in the right conditions, then, then that's then, then the concept and the basis of the concept of, of this approach. So yes, it's, it's restoration rather than protection. Okay, thank you very much. And then it kind of feeds into another question that's just come in from Suje. Is there, is there a role or a possibility to combine the cell therapy approach with the gene therapy approach? Were they perhaps targeting different uh, patient populations? Uh, 
should I take it or? Go ahead, Marcelo. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, this, this we are talking about very, very early days here, and uh, and all the combinations are are potentially uh, possible. And the more we work, the more that we develop these strategies, uh, that kind of synergy will become more obvious and apparent. Uh, for our particular uh, application, sort of in the neuropathies and with the technology that we have, uh, it, it would seem that you don't need uh, to use any kind of uh, added kind of uh, uh, synergetic sort of uh, uh, application like, like gene therapy, but for other conditions, uh, absolutely, it could be it, it could be a it could be the way to go. Okay, great. And Karen, I know you listed a few um, publications in the area. Are these products sort of still in development? Um, and are there other sort of gene therapies that, that you're aware of? And whereabouts are they in that kind of clinical pathway? And how close are they to getting to the patients? So I think we're still a ways away from, from the clinical pathways. Um, I don't know of um, researchers who are working already in the human path with AV. I, I've heard that there's some small companies, uh, particularly out in Boston, that are working and they talk about uh, in the next two to three years having something in the pipeline. But I haven't heard anything concrete. So I think we're still very much in the animal model stage when it comes to AV. Okay, um, and what do you think it's going to take or do you think is needed to be able to really move that forward? Well, one of the complications, uh, well, certainly a lot more research and, and funding, but I think one of the complications that we have with hereditary hearing loss is it's essentially many forms of rare diseases because uh, I talked about SIN4 and why we believe that our work is very dramatic and important. It is, does only affect about five families worldwide that are known in Israel, in the UK, and in Turkey. And so it's hard to imagine a company putting a lot of effort into um, a therapy that's going to help five families. And so there are the genes that are more common, like TMC1, like SLC26A4, that there'll be more of an effort on the part of companies. And these rare diseases, so to speak, or the rare, the small groups of hereditary deafness in that are rarer forms will probably end up being in the group of other rare diseases where there just isn't a lot of clinical human work being done on them. Uh, but as I think the technologies and the resources get stronger and better, it could be that that next step will be working on those rare diseases, but we're not quite there yet. Sure. Okay, thanks very much. And Robin, I'm looking over to you and the, the work you've done in, in the ophthalmology area. Are there, where, how, does, how does hearing compare in the, the products that we've seen today and that are elsewhere within the industry? And how did you overcome or how can, can you overcome those challenges in getting through into the patients um, with relatively small populations? Yes, th thank you, Lee. Um, I mean, my, my initial thoughts, I mean, wonderful talks today and really impressive results, wonderful proof of concept. Um, and I think, um, I, I think if, we, if we compare with um, the... the Feels that gene therapy for 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 um, uh, auditory loss deafness compared with retinal disorders. I think um, we're we're a few years behind in terms of translation. So um, the next step for the hearing for for, for um, gene therapy for hearing loss is the first set of clinical trials um, and determining whether the vectors are. Um, are tolerated, what levels of immune response are elicited, whether they're able to transduce human cells. I think there may still be some um, room for perhaps some, some more human primate work to, to sort of bridge that, non-human primate work to bridge the gap. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're still learning a lot um, from the first set of trials in, uh, for, for, for um, inocular gene therapy. Um, there are still issues to solve that. And so I think until you translate and start to get some results back from, from first in human uh, trials, I think it's very difficult to, 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 
to predict or determine what the issues are. Some of them are obvious, immune responses, um, target cells, um, but also, you know, it's important to understand what the point of intervention is. It, is it possible to get transduction, as efficient transduction in, um, in, in adults and, 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 and children compared with a, a P1 or P0 mouse? I mean, so that there are some really, some really simple questions that have to be, that have to be addressed. And I, I suspect that there'll be a lot more experiments in, in, in non-human primates to sort of address that. I mean, some of the issues come down to vectors. I'd be interested to hear from Karen as to, as to what she thinks the best vector is for the era. I'd always assume that it was ANC-80 um, and that the AV9, we know that whilst great for the brain CNS in mice, doesn't, doesn't translate into efficient um, transduction for NHP. Um, so, so, so these are sort of things that will become apparent. Michael, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, we've actually had um, some some early experience with NK80 when we were, uh, you know, just starting out working on on this project, and we didn't have um, the results were kind of um, not so convincing. I mean, it's an it, 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 it is was it was just like one prep, you know, and one prep of virus that we got. So it could be just like a, but but the, there have been um, other um, researchers in the field um, saying that they they've had some stability issues with the NK80, and there's this kind of rumor going around that the companies have steered away from that too. Um, so there could be some some stability issue with that with that capsid and. With the AV9 PHPD, we're getting, I mean, not, not only us, but also other groups have shown um, very high transduction rates also in non-human primates. Right, very good. That's interesting because again, it comes down to the specific cell type. So it may work perfectly well in the ear, whereas not so well in the brain. So that's, that's very interesting. But these things are obviously gonna be critical for, for translation. You've gotta hit the right cell type and, um, so that that's very encouraging, and 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 do you have do you have any idea about how much vector you can deliver in NHPs without elicit? I mean, you know, eliciting immune responses. How well to tolerated is it? That, that's a, I think that's a very important question, um, especially when it comes to translating anything to the clinic. Um, there was uh, in in the one. Uh, well, there's like one and a half, but in the one study that really looked at uh, the immune response to the AV9 PHPB in the cochlea, they injected um, up to seven times 10 to the 11th um, viral genomes. And uh, the, 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 they, they delivered the GFP in, 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 in those vectors and they say that they, they show some, some kind of infiltration in the spiral ganglion. And they say that they don't know if, if, uh, if this is due to an immune response against the GFP or against the capsid, um, which was a bit of a shame. Um, it will probably be against the capsid. I mean, it will be my guess, but um, yeah. Yeah, so they did see some inf infiltration four weeks after the, after the injection of, of Ten, but but it's, it's it's a relatively high dose. Yeah, uh, seven times ten to the eleventh. And what's the minimum dose you need to actually get efficient transduction? Um, so there, in that paper, when they went below three times ten to the eleventh, they saw a drop in efficiency. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that's. I, I think it's it's really early days in terms of delivering into uh, non-human primates, and I think also the delivery route could could affect that. So, um, I, yeah, I think. But I think it's going to be probably around that that you know order of magnitude, I guess. And if I can add, so you talk about the cell specificity, specificity. So that's really crucial. For example, with Connexin twenty six, which is we know is the most common form of hereditary deafness, but there, there is still not um, the ideal candidate AV to go specifically into those cells. 
And there you also have the point of intervention because if the hearing loss there is occurring um, during embryogenesis in humans, do we really think it's gonna be feasible to go in prenatally with, it's one thing to, to give a mouse um, a dose of AV once it's born, because mice only start hearing two weeks after birth. So we do have complications when we're thinking about transitioning to humans, no question about it. Yeah. I know that's a question that's come up a few times in, in the chat bar, in the Q&A bar, sorry, um, is looking at the best route of delivery, both for cell and gene therapies. Um, and if, if there's any sort of consideration there and complexities or is there's a relatively straight way, easy way forward. So, sorry, I, I missed that, Lee, sort of the, the... Yeah, so what's the, the uh, route of delivery for your products into, into the patients? Yeah, in, 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 in our approach, it has to be local delivery through surgery. Uh, we, we have a kind of a, a, a predicted sort of, a, 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 we are developing the, 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 the approach that will be compatible with the animal model, which is sort of, uh, it's very similar to the cochlear implantation, but then getting into the modulo. So it's, it's a minimum alteration of a very well-established sur surgery in otology. And that's something that we are sort of having a discussion and, and, and developing with our sort of, uh, clinical colleagues to, to, to do that. Uh, the systemic delivery, which will be obviously easier, I don't think it will be feasible for this type of therapy. Uh, so it will have to be localized, but there are potentially other ways of making it local. But uh, we, what we want to do is to initially to work with something which is, it is common practice in otology because cochlear implant surgery, it is well established, uh, but it will give us something which is very compatible to the proof of concept that we have done in the animal model. Okay. Yeah, and if I can add, I, I think that that route of delivery will be very feasible if we talk about practicalities uh, I used to give a talk in the early days about when we, gene discovery, and there was a very well-known otolaryngologist in the audience, and he always would raise his hand and he'd say, are you trying to put me out of business? And I assured him that when we have the ability to perform gene delivery, that he, we're going to need him to actually perform the delivery. So I do think it's actually a very practical way of looking at it, that the delivery will need to be done by the physicians. Um, I think that the systemic delivery will be a lot more challenging. And why is that the systemic? Well, we just have, you have to get into that. And one of the advantages of the ear is right that it's isolated, but that's also one of the disadvantages. Yeah. Um, and to, there's just too many pathways. The and the encasing. Yeah. So you get to the ear, but the direct delivery will be optimal and there's a relatively easy way to do so. Yeah. I have a couple of questions for Marcelo, if I may. Uh, Marcelo, um, what can, what conditions are you are you aiming to treat in your first clinical trial? I know it's lost, you, it's replacing spiral uh, ganglion cells. Um, what's the, what's the incidence of, of 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 that in the in the UK? And is it are there conditions in which the, the hair cells are also lost? So are you going to do this in combination with a cochlear implant to support? Yeah, it? yeah. Conceptually, we can we can do both. We we could do it sort of just on its own right. What is called the, the pure neuropathies, which is it's a smaller group. Uh, the the incidence sort of it depends on sort of who you read in the literature is if it, it varies. Uh, it goes from like eight, ten percent to 20, 25 percent, depending of, of, of the way that is measured. Uh, that's the other thing, because it's a condition that it has been a uh, clinician has been unable to do a lot for it. Uh, the tools to 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 characterize that and 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 to and to measure the phenotype are available, but they are not, uh, in many cases, uh, commonly used in the in the practice. Uh, but there are ways, very well established ways of measuring the the, the phenotype and diagnosing sort of these neuropathies. Uh, if you have the, the pure neuropathy, you will expect to have hair cells, so and that's very. Uh, similar to the, our current sort of uh, proof of concept model, but you could also uh, use it in combination with a cochlear implant, and that will make it sort of probably uh, uh, available or, or applicable to a wider range of, of patients because patients that 
uh, they have lost both, and then you can look for the interaction between the cochlear implant and the and the transplant cells. And we're also developing the proof of concept for that as well. And and just to follow up, how many um, functional connected cells do you think you might need to provide clinical benefit? That, uh, something that, that's actually meaningful to a patient? We don't think that you need a lot. Uh, probably our, our, our animal data shows that about, it's difficult to measure, so to, to, to be certain that all the cells are functionally connected. But what we get is a restoration on average in the region of about, with the doses that we have been using, or about 30% the complement of neurons. Uh, we are now exploring if we can get higher numbers by modifying the dose and, and, and scaling things up. Uh, but 30% of restoration of neurons uh, seem to be, uh, and that's very much in line with the data of neuropathies on, and, and, and data on counting of, uh, of neuronal loss in, in temporal balls, for example. So it's, you don't need, we're aiming for 30, 40,000 neurons, but you don't need all of them in order to have meaningful recovery. So I know we've talked about sort of the different animal models and I'm, I know this, you mentioned that almost all these products are still sort of in the preclinical development. Do you think the, the right preclinical models are in place or there's a need for improvement here to help uh, with the development of those products? I think we have, at the moment, we have good models, uh, mm -hmm. but obviously you can always improve them and, and there is always range not long ago, about a year ago, we did a very comprehensive review of the models for the particular condition that we are studying in neuropathy. And we think that the model that we're using is, is very, very good. But and there are a range of models, but I think the one that we're using is probably the best one. But there are there, there is range for improvement and getting developing better models uh, with sort of a, a more control in the in the tuning of the phenotype, it will be uh, a clear advantage, and that is still and, and that is certainly the case for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. And, and so then, looking at that, what are the main regulatory considerations you're really having to focus on at, focus on now to make sure that you're you're addressing those concerns before you then reach the clinic? Uh, yeah, Marcelo. Uh, yeah, yeah. Karen's on. Uh, Regulate sort of a, the different aspect of it. Obviously, safety is the paramount. Uh, making sure that we uh, know our our product, our cells, uh, that they are safe, that they don't produce any uh, un unwanted side effects. Particularly with stem cells, there is always this concern about uh, tumor formation, tumor, gene uh, tumor, tumor genicity. Uh, and and we done work, and we are working sort of trying to make sure that we we control that, and we are in a in a in sort of we, we are are the technology is safe uh so far all our data is is very uh encouraging it seems to sort of we don't see any any evidence of of, of of formation of tumors uh the other thing is as you well know with cellular products is a, a very well established manufacturing strategy and and, and very well robust control uh with with, with good sort of a uh QC assays to be able to inform again on the on the safety of the manufacturing assay uh, and, and the potential characterization for potential impurities in the cell population that you are producing, which is something that we're also uh, developing and working quite a lot as well. And, and just before we pass over to Karen with a similar question, I wonder if uh, Mustafa could really comment on the sort of standardization around sort of stem cell manufacturing yeah. processes and analytics a little bit. Sure, I think um, Marcelo, you sort of got, got it right there in terms of uh, for, for the ear, as, as you've pointed out, and I think Karen as well, that the dose that you're going to require of the cell therapy or even the AAV vector is, is relatively low. I think one, one of the challenges a lot of other indications have is that scale up to be able to really meet uh, the, the, the need, even to make enough for clinical trials, but then to, to then make enough for, 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 for the market. Whereas that's less of an issue here, but you've still got issues around the standardization and, 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 and having... A consistent and robust product and i think with 
with cell therapy as much, and I'm sure you're sort of aware of something that we see quite regularly, that they have very long processes um, and, and and really very little monitoring at the different stages of, of, of that very long process. It's sort of, you know what you're starting with, and then you look at the end whether you have the right thing. Um, but if anything's gone wrong, you don't know where it's gone wrong and, and, and how to improve it. So I think there's a lot of challenges around understanding your manufacturing process and understanding the products that you're getting at the intermediate steps of your of your manufacturing process that's that's really critical really important um and, and, and a huge challenge that needs to be addressed in, in the cell therapy space especially in the stem cell therapy space thanks and i think um there are obviously differences between cell therapies and, and gene therapy products but a lot to be considered when you're looking at the manufacturing processes and making sure that that product is well characterized so I was just I was just envious. I think you, how long is your process, Marcelo? It's Matt. It's how many days? Is it days? To get to, get to the process is about twelve days, two weeks. Yes. So we're talking for our cell therapy for for um, photoreceptors, transplanting photoreceptors. It's seventeen weeks. So I was I was thinking it was uh, <laughs> you, you know I was looking at with some envy actually, and we you know we're developing GMP process for over seventeen weeks, which is a big big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think just just to add to that, I'm just really curious, I guess, Marcello and maybe Robin, even for, for the eye, one, one of the things that um, is quite interesting, because you're, you're growing these cells in, in essentially conditions that they love to be in, because you've optimized them to really like these conditions and work really well. And then they're going into a, a disease environment, which is very different to what the cells are used to. Do you think there's any sort of challenges around that phase of actually getting the cells into the patient and keeping them happy and 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 do you have any ideas as to how you might overcome those i i think a, a, a lot of that obviously we can learn from the from the preclinical models but a lot of the 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 more critical information will come from the clinical trials when we are kind of in the because at the end of the day we're always playing second best when when you're preparing this kind of thing because you're working with a human cell in in a in an animal model, and, and if you work with the with the with the animal equivalent cell, then you're not working with the with the therapeutic product. You're working with something else, which is particularly the case with a lot of the work with the comparison between mouse and, and human cells. So I think a lot of that information will come when we uh, started doing the the clinical trials. But certainly there is the possibility that some trophic factors may be. Uh, may be needed. And, and, and going back to one of the original question about combined strategies using perhaps cells with, with gene therapy or cells with factors, that may be the thing to explore in the future. So ju just to address that, uh, Mr. Fer, I mean, what, what we've found in transplanting um, uh, photoreceptor uh, precursors into, into uh, models of retinal degeneration um, the 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 photoreceptors actually like the the in vivo ocular environment. They continue to mature and elaborate out of segments. So actually, we can mature the photoreceptor more readily in the eye than we can if we were to maintain them in culture. We don't have the 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 we've been spent years improving the in vitro conditions for maturing photoreceptors in vitro, but we can't replicate the conditions in vivo. Uh, as well. So I think they like the in vivo milieu. The, the challenge, I think, is comes down to connectivity and the scarring um, and the, the gliosis that we know occurs in, in, in degenerative pro And that may be that, you know, we've seen nevertheless that in our animal models, um, the, the, we see synapse formation and the possibility of overcoming the, that, that, that gliosis. But I think it, we're using one inbred mouse model. I mean, when we come to clinical trials, we're going to be transplanting into patients. We're at different stages to see some really advanced. They're not all the same. And so the, this is the challenge of, of translating the, you know, the research findings where you take, take a, a homogeneous um, um, model, transplanting all at the same uh, time point, more or less the disease process is identical. Humans not going to, it's not going to be like that in, in reality. So that is yet another chance that the, 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 the heterogeneity and, and of the disease, even if we take the same genetic condition. 
Really agree with that. That's, that's fantastic, thank you. Um, so looking over to you, Karen, I know we kind of skirted around the safety issues and talked about different safety and efficacy of different serotypes, kind of looking forward at the gene therapy field, although still relatively nascent and kind of coming through, is the future, do you think, with viral vectors or is there an opportunity for other technologies to come in and improve safety and efficacy of these products? Shaha, what do you think? As a future MD, you're going to be one of those guys who is going to be possibly inserting into humans. Though we just heard, I just you could be replaced by a robot. So <laughs> look at that. <laughs> make my life easier. I just go back to the university, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, there have been some some uh, attempts to to look at, at you know um, the lipid formulations or other kinds of, of non-viral um, delivery methods. Um, so far, seems with limited success. The only real success I can think of is was the paper by um, by Gao at Al at twenty eighteen. Uh, where they used um, lipofectamine to deliver Cas9 protein into hair cells. And even that has been much approved, uh, improved with, uh, with AAVs since then. Um, so it does seem right now like AAVs work far better than anything um, synthetic that there is. Although, yeah, I guess when, when you take into consideration the, the GMP and all of that, um, you know, making AVs in cells could be uh, difficult. Um, but, but so far, we haven't, we, we had a, a short attempt, a uh, small attempt uh, to, to, to use uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles, like ionizable lipids, and that didn't work at all. But, you know, maybe someone else could, could, could make that work better than us. That's fine. And do you think sort of targeting, uh, or are there different targets within sort of ocular indications that, that you could be going for with similar approaches and your therapies be relevant for? Such as? Um, I'm just reading out for one of the ones that have come through. Uh, I'm not sure. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> with the, the indications of patient populations you, you are targeting at the moment, is your plan, do you have a platform technology that could be used with other populations or would it be kind of starting from scratch and, and building, building from that? Well, if, if I could add, so in, in each case, if we're looking at different genes, then it's just about building the AV, um, you know, building the, the platform to insert the particular gene and having the appropriate mouse model. So actually, what has been done previously and what we've been able to show with a SIN4 is something that's very easily transferable to another gene. Um, and in some cases, it'll be a population that's much larger, for example, myosin 6 related deafness. Uh, like I said before, SLC26A4 or TMC1. So it, it is really transferable. And that's why each one of these cases of the proof of concept, even if it's in a small population, becomes very important. Uh, the key there, as we mentioned earlier, will be the specificity of the cell type. So the two that I mentioned were myosin 6 and TMC1, as well as SIN4. We're talking about inner and outer hair cells, so this PHB can be worked very well. If we're talking about connexin 26 or SLC26A4 that are other cell types, there still is not an optimal, um, an optimal target with respect to AAV. Could, could I ask um, Karen? Um, give an update on or what you know about the uh, atonal um, gene therapy trial and, and where, that, where that got to and, and what, what issues were uh, you know, un un uncovered and what, what you think about the future of that program. Yeah, so unfortunately I have to say that I don't know enough about that. I don't know uh, why it was halted and whether it's continuing. Marcella, do you have more information on that? No, I only have a, a sort of read a few things that Larry, Larry Lusting sort of made comments about that the, the magnitude or, or the frequency of the recovery was not as significant as, as it was expected. That's why they, they sort of transiently have suspended it. Uh, it hasn't been, as far as I know, completely closed, but it's been suspended. But that's all I know. I, I, I don't have any more sort of direct uh, information. 
However, I think although it's, 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 it's a great strategy and it was it was very exciting when it was started and, and kind of uh, basically sort of it takes off from the work of particularly sort of Josh Raphael and, 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 and Gao as well uh, going after this key gene. It's a single gene. And, and even your Raphael group sort of showed them sort of more than 10 years ago, more than that, that is very context dependent. So you need to have the rare, the cells kind of in the, in the right kind of uh, competent state in order to be hit and become a hair cell. Now people are investigating or are developing uh, a combination of growth factor or transition factor, sorry, that could be uh, potentially more successful because just that this idea that you have a master regulatory transcription factor that will convert a complete lineage uh, on any cell, it, 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 was, it was limited. And, 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 and I think that's probably what is happening here. If, if, if you have a kind of a right cell in the right state, you will probably make the trick, but, but it's not gonna happen in all of them. I, I really hope that, that, you know, that the study is, is published and you know, with all the details, because aside from whether the therapy is effective, what's really important for the field to move forward is to understand how well the, the vector was tolerated, because you know, it's establishing a platform for the field. Is it possible to, to deliver adenoviral vectors and have it well tolerated? Are there, is there a huge inflammation? All of that, I mean, the details matter and, and allow the field to move forward. So it, it will be a real, you know, shame if 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 a trial is 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 halted, suspended, and then you know, and it shouldn't be. It's a clinical trials dot gov. It should be written up and presented because the field can learn from from any Absolutely. trial. Absolutely, I I I have attended to a few talks by Larry and by by Harry Stacker as well, when they de de describe kind of the the amount of work involved in the GMP production and also in the in the approach how to deliver these yeah. these particles in 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 the inner ear, and just that is is worth of a lot of attention and consideration, regardless of the of the outcome. And as you said, the outcome is kind of secondary. It's, it's all it's all the sort of step by step process. It's a build up process. Yeah. So absolutely, yeah. I think that the 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 advance that it has achieved, even if it's not as successful as expected, uh, shouldn't be disregarded. Yes. I think we have to remember we're building step by step, and it's uh, you know it's uh, it's important to. Uh, um, to, to um, learn from each and every one of the, of the trials and every almost, you know, we're talking about handfuls of patients, you can learn from each, you know, almost each administration can, can, can be a, a valuable uh, source of information data and, and plan the next sort of set, yeah. of, set of patients and next studies. In response to what you're saying, Marcelo, I would probably add PAL4H3 and GFI1 to the mix. Sorry? I would probably, in response to what you were saying earlier, I would add GFI one and PAL four H three to the mix. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. So I think we've only got a, a couple of minutes left, um, but I want to pose one more question. I think it's kind of to, to the whole panel, really. Um, obviously, cell and gene therapies. We're only getting a few now that are reaching the market, and gaining authorization, and the price tags that are associated with those. Obviously. Is Carter Kimria about two three hundred dollars per per dose? Getting things like Lux Turner coming through for eye treatment, which I think is half a million dollars per eye. Thinking about the indications you're going for on the patient populations, how how can we make sure that the, the products that you're making and the next generation of cell and gene therapies coming through are going to be accessible and affordable by healthcare organisations and the patients? I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I'll go with myself. Oh, go on, Robin. Yeah. Yeah, as a as a as a comment, I think we just got to you know take the broader perspective and say you know look at the price of the first motor car or you know new technologies, and the first of you know uh, are really uh, really expensive, and as they become established, the price is inevitably to come down. I think the issue is that for the moment is not the price. This is um, the, these are lost leaders essentially. Um, and it's establishing the technology, and we'll find you know this is there, there. There has to be some incentive for investors to invest in these early stage, high risk products. But once once the technology is established, and what matters is efficacy, proving efficacy, the price will come down. 
I mean, I, I think it's as simple as that, but, but I'm an optimist. Yeah, initially, obviously, and we are sort of uh, through being redoing a lot of analysis on the cost of goods and, and, and trying sort of to, to, to understand where it's going to be. Sort of the, 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 but but as, as, as Robin is saying, the, once you have, the, the important thing is to develop the technology. And, 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 and another comparison is with the technology of the, of the, of the desktop PCs. 20, 30 years ago, it cost a fortune and it, and and it sort of you could do very very limited with them and 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 now for a few hundred pounds you can get a fantastic I mean, you can get an, a, a phone that sort of can can do more computing than your your top of the line uh, computing sort of 20 30 years ago so price uh, for the development of of the of the therapy itself i don't think price should be a factor obviously in the commercial setting there is always a factor and it's always a concern but you it's a feasibility. Can we do it? And then sort of the, the, the price sort of will, will, will follow. Excellent. Thanks very much. I wish we had a bit more time to go around and get everybody's thoughts, but I think we're, we're at the end of the webinar. So thank you very much to everybody on the panel and for the presentations today. And I'm just going to hand over to, to Ralph to close out. Okay, th th thanks, Lee. And, and thanks, thanks everyone um, for taking part in the, in the webinar. Um, this afternoon, fantastic discussion. Re really, really enjoyed it. Um, so, so of course, um, this is the, the the final webinar in in our series, um, and we've heard heard a lot about the you know great advances being made in discovery, preclinical, and clinical research o over these four um, seminars. Um, I think it's fantastic that there there are over a hundred therapeutics for hearing loss um, in the pipeline in development, um, and I think coupled you know all that coupled with the the growing interest from investors and pharma, I think it gives people who are seeking better treatments for hearing loss and tinnitus real hope for the future. So, so as Karen said at the beginning of her talk, um, I think it's a really exciting time for, for the field. Um, the Hearing Medicines Discovery Syndicate is, is here to help um, connect you with the expertise and infrastructure um, that's needed to fast track the development of um, treatments for hearing loss. So, so please do get in touch. We, we look forward to finding out how the syndicate can help you. Um, so finally, I just want to say a really big thank you to my colleagues, um, Claudia Conslives at RNID, Jessica Lee and Beverly Isherwood at the Medicines Discovery Catapult for organizing this fantastic um, webinar series that we've all been enjoying. Um, thank you so much for, for all of your hard work and making it possible. And thank you everyone for, for joining us. So that's it, thank you very much. And Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone.